So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about how the Roman Catholic Church turns Jesus into a sinner that encourages you to sin. Now, I'm doing this video on my laptop, also on my phone here. If you're watching this from TikTok or even Instagram, you're going to have to open up your Bible yourself. You're just going to see this thumbnail. But uh, anyway... Uh, let's let's open up the scriptures here and I'll show you what I mean. In Genesis chapter 9, at verse 3, we read God telling Noah something. And this is before the law of Moses, right? This is before Moses is, is even born and comes around, right? As it says here in Genesis 9, 3, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I give you everything as I... Gave you the green plants and vegetables, but you shall not eat meat along with its life, that is, its blood. Right? So there, in Genesis chapter 9, barely getting into the Bible, God forbids the ingestion of blood. Then Moses comes around, and he's given a law from God himself. And in Leviticus 17, we're told a little bit about this. And this is at verse 14, it says, For in regard to the life of all flesh, its blood is the same as its life. Therefore, I said to the Israelites, you are not to eat the blood of any flesh. For the life of all flesh is, it, is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off, excluded, cut off, excluding him from the atonement made for them. So it's a pretty big deal here not to ingest blood of any flesh, any, right? There's no exceptions made. Then Acts 15. This is after Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day for our justification. He ascended to heaven and then the, the Jews... They're trying to figure out what are they going to do with the Gentiles because the Gentiles are believing, right? The message isn't just going to the Jews. They rejected it. So the message is going out to the Gentiles, the rest of the world. And they're deciding what is it that we uh, have them to do because they're not burdened to keep the law like we were. So they have this council and they decide this. Acts 15 verse 20, it says, but that we write to them that they are to abstain from anything that has been contaminated by being offered to idols and from sexual impurity and from eating meat of what has been strangled and from the consumption of blood. They make no exception, such as for the blood of Jesus. Then when you come down to verse 28, they say it again. For it seems good to the Holy Spirit, to God himself here now, right? It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to place on you any greater burden than these essentials. So these are the essential things a Christian needs to abstain from. They abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from consuming blood. Real big, right? They keep mentioning it. And from eating the meat of things that have been strangled because the blood is still in that. 
such as if a cow, you can eat a cow, but if it's strangled, the blood is still in it and seeps into the meat. You can't eat the blood, so you can't eat that, right? That's why it says away from things that are strangled. And from sexual impurity, if you keep yourself from these things, you will do well, fare well. Now, so we see here three times, right? Two or three witnesses, you establish a fact, you establish a doctrine, you establish the word, right? We have a witness from before the law, we have a witness from under the law, and then we have a witness after the law saying not to ingest blood right and the roman catholics take jesus saying to eat my flesh and drink my blood to be literal so he is telling them to sin when he is having this passover seder this picture that you're looking at right now passover seder is the meal actually right before the passover where they offer up the lamb right and Every year, they would have unleavened bread. As you can see here, it's striped because it's like on a grill. There would be bubbles that come up that they would pop with something like a toothpick or, you know, a fork or something like that. And then they would break this bread and they would pass it around. So you see how Jesus is saying, this is my body that is broken for you. You notice how it's striped, it's pierced, and then it's broken and passed around. He's, he's saying... This Passover Seder that you have every year, it's telling you about me and the sacrifice I'm about to make. Because at the Last Supper, Jesus is telling them what he's about to go do. But you notice how they none of them get it, right? He's telling them all along that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to die, but they don't get it. So he's telling them through this story here. He's, and then he says the, the grape juice, which is what they would have, the new wine. They would take the grapes and they would squeeze it freshly into the cup, right? Just like Jesus being crushed in the wine press of the wrath of God that he takes on for us and his blood is poured out. And he's saying, see, this, this is my blood poured out for you. So he's saying this Passover meal, this Passover Seder meal, it points to me. Just like the Passover lamb points to Jesus, but it's not literally Jesus. It's not literally his blood and his flesh. The lamb does not become Jesus and you sacrifice Jesus when you sacrifice the lamb. Neither does the bread and the wine literally become Jesus' body and blood. This is a parable. It's a metaphor. If Jesus was telling them to ingest blood, that this was literally his blood, he would be sinning to tell, by telling them to break the law of God, and they would be sinning by ingesting blood. And not to mention that Peter, if you go to Acts chapter 10, you'll read about Peter having a vision given from God, where God shows him unclean animals and says, rise, Peter, and eat. And what does Peter say? No, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. So Peter rejects God three times when God is telling him that he can eat these unclean animals. But you believe that he ingested literal blood and he had no objection to it. So you see how he, he knew that this is not literal. Just like when you read John chapter 6, right after Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, the people are saying, this is a hard saying. So Jesus explains what he means. Verse 63 of John 6, and going into verse 64, Jesus says, it is the spirit that quickens. It is the spirit that gives life and energizes. The flesh profits nothing. It, it's, as, it's of no use. My words, they are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you that don't believe. By verse 66, that's when people leave because they don't want his words. They want something literal, literal bread. And then verse 68, when Peter's answering Jesus about if he's going to leave too, along with the other 12, the other of the 12, Peter says, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. So we see that Peter understood that this was not literal. Right? Just like when Jesus was explaining to them to beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and of the Herods. 
And they were like, oh, because we don't have bread and we shouldn't get their bread. Jesus is like, no. Did you not learn about when I was feeding these 5,000 people with a few loaves and the 4,000 and the 7,000 with a few loaves that it's not about bread? It's about the word of God. And then they understood, oh, the leaven is their doctrines, their false doctrines, such as the Eucharist being Jesus' literal body and blood. That is a sin. And if it is literally body, uh, body and blood of a man, it's also cannibalism. No way around it. So, this is something that is done in remembrance of what Jesus literally did for you, dying for you, and going through that for you. It's not literally his body and blood. You're not saved and have eternal life by eating this, but by believing on what Jesus did for you, what this actually represents. So thank you for watching, and take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12, at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible, the Scriptures, are the written Word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying, it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written to search the scriptures, bring them up, 
they testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested of the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he's, he actually called the Berians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word, and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit, and become one with his Spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word, you are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 25 through 27. Husbands love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. With the washing of water. By the word. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle. Or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7 to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name. They're prophesying in his name. They're casting out devils in his name. They're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as... Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. 
So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked, was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness, he says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So that fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tie, didn't tie. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. <laughs> you have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. <laughs>